Colin, thank you so much for being on the show. It's really an honor to have you on. Thank you, Adam. Delighted to be here. Talking uh, about my favorite subject, hotels and hospitality. And you just wrote a, your, what, 11th book on, uh, this, on this? Yes, this is my 11th book, and I called yep. it but the gold standard, giving your customers what they didn't know they wanted. Why did you write the book? Okay, so the reason I wrote the book was, and I'm sure that you agree with me, we don't need another app. We don't need another piece of technology. We don't need another product or another service. We live in a very saturated world. So how do we navigate our way through that? And most importantly, how do we stand out in the crowd? And that's why I thought together with delivering proactive customer service and creating those emotional connections will allow you to stay connected and stand out in front of the crowd. That's it. There's so many topics that I want to jump into here because this is, we were talking sort of the preamble before the show. The book is about subjects that we, we strive to ingrain in the service culture in luxury hotels, but none of it happens by accident. So I'm really uh, interested to get your perspective on, on, on really the deep diving into some of the points of the book. Um, but before we get too deep into it, how has the last 18 months been for you? What's been, what's been going on? Well, you know, I, I got married in South Africa, 022220, which I thought was an extraordinary date, had an amazing honeymoon, got back to, to New York City, and four days later, we were in lockdown. Um, and all I did for, yeah, for the next five or six days was, for my events business, this party's mm -hmm. canceled, we can't get married this year, we're going to postpone it. And I literally saw millions and millions of dollars disappear for the next 18 months, and I think myself, I need to get smart really quickly. So I did the ultimate pivot. I took my, a lot of my team, I redirected them. I've done a tremendous amount of work in the hospitality space as creative director for NetJets, creative director for the Mirror Hotel in Hong Kong, and, and have consulted here, then everywhere. But I never really gave it a name and put it in an umbrella and, and made it, it, took it really seriously. So I laser focused, got everything lined up, put it together, launched the website. I called 20 developers, uh, 10 of them, uh, every one of them ret returned my phone call. I zeroed in on wanting to work with MSD Capital because they had just bought the Boca Raton Club. And uh, I interviewed with them, I spoke with them. They were very excited because, you know, think about it, as a party planner, as a producer, as an author, as a product designer, I had all these skill sets that I put under one umbrella so I was like five different consulting companies under one umbrella. Uh, cut a long story short, six weeks later, I was living in Miami with a new office. I had this one plant project, which I'm absolutely loving what, what I'm doing. And uh, shortly after that, signed another two projects. So literally out of my darkest moment came my brightest light. Man, that pivot is something that people in our industry have been trying to figure out for about 18 months now. And, you know, yeah, yes. I mean, jobs are coming back and some people at least a few months ago were getting back into it. But, you know, now things are starting to slow down again. Yes. Was it having that bravery, I suppose, to, to, to take everything that you've been doing and focus it in one direction? Uh, how did... What, what was the process for understanding or seeing the writing on the wall, I suppose? Like thinking that what I was doing before probably isn't going to be, it's not going to be like it was before as we come out of this. How, how did you, how did you sort of muster your, not just your, your creative juices, but your network and all of the things that helped you launch this, uh, this new venture in such short time that might help somebody who's maybe trying to do that on their own right now. I just looked at the skill set and I figured that if I, if I presented it differently and I presented to different ears, looking for what they're looking for, and I could answer a question and solve solutions for them and bring all of my 35 years of experience and look at a hotel through a blank set of eyes, like a blank canvas and figure we can program this way. We can do this morning, noon, and night. If we can do morning, noon, and night, we can do it spring, summer, winter, fall. We can have all this incredible programming, creating the most ultimate guest experience for your guest to keep them involved and to keep them emotionally connected and to keep them front of mind. So working with a very similar team, I was able to come into a resort, have a look at it, and then also find alternative revenue streams. Um, you know, having traveled 15 and a half million miles around the world, 
I have a pretty good idea on new trends of what's happening in banqueting. And for instance, I had to figure out what is a glamorous way to serve food when we can't have buffets or stations or cocktail parties. So I rewound the clock to France and I brought out the old Girardons. And I started doing <laughs> fabulous Girardon service with a cover over them. So we took something that was like supposed to be clinical and I made it glamorous, chic and elegant. Yeah. Yeah, what's all this, this new time, again? You know, we, have, we have beautiful Girardons that are going through the lobby and the lounge, and we have a gazpacho offering. We do an afternoon tea offering. I, 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 I present cocktails and appetizers at 6 o'clock all the way through, and at 10 o'clock at night, it's red wine and dark chocolate and a sexy good night. Oh, man. And it's yeah. and there's some theater behind it. There has to be. That's the thing that Absolutely. gets people, at least at least on the surface, like, uh, what's going on over there? What's, what's all that about? Yeah. And then, you know, everything sort of builds yeah. and, and creates that emotional connection activation with good substance behind it yeah yeah um so wow okay let's diving into the book here um one of the points that is in the book is talking about giving customers what they don't know they want uh, and I, I feel like, at least anecdotally, a lot of what I've been hearing from people that are on the ground, you know, that, thinking about that that front desk agent or that reservation agent that's making uh, a reservation for somebody, or that restaurant server who's just, you know, trying to figure things out in this new world, um, who's being told by their manager, hey, engage your guests in a more meaningful way. You've got to create emotional connections with people. How How have you been able to go about... Um, explaining that in a way that gets the people that work with you excited about going in, getting through that, that the grind of the events, how do you get people, I suppose, fundamentally to really care about what they're doing so that they can create those emotional connections with people? You know, I, th I think I want to rewind the clock just a little bit here because all of our businesses have changed. Some of, our, uh, some of our product has changed, or it's a little bit different. Some of us are working remotely. Some are doing a hybrid of where they're working remotely or, or physically. So I think that the first order of the day is to check our goal is still the same. Okay, our vision is still the same. But let's go and look at the vision statement, at the mission statement, right? Can we dust up on it? Can we make sure that it, it's working and telling us what we have to do right now and focus on our guiding principles? I think that's the very first thing because we get everybody now who's been working disparately to come together, to be focused, to be one team with one goal in mind headed in the right direction. So now we've got everybody emotionally aligned together because the internal emotional connection is just important as the external emotional connection. So then I work with the team to make sure what does that customer want? The customer wants value. They want a good they want a good product at the right price. The customer wants to feel valued. We know that they have a choice. They want it to be hassle free. It needs to happen immediately. We've all got the tension span of a net. Right, mm. So it should be one quick and proactive and in person. And the same thing today, when you think about online shopping, you know, you want to return a gift or something, a purchase. It was six different steps. Now it's one step and it's returned. So I think you mm. want to be able to stand by your product. And more than anything, I want to teach our people that in customer service or service delivery, consistency is the most important thing because it's your credibility. It's your reputation. If we go somewhere and we have a great experience at a hotel for the last three visits, and we go there the fourth time, and it's not that great. You think, is there a new manager? Is there a change in staff? Automatically, you've just lost the credibility. So I think to teach the fact that consistency is of paramount importance, it's really, really important to consistently every single time. And that can only happen if we've given the team the right protocols and we have the right process in place so that we've informed them and taught them exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. So yeah, you know, and I, that, I think that for, that for me gives us a good idea of really figuring out a module of what our customer wants. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that comes down to, at least in part, the involvement of of the le the leader who's you know whoever's running the show it's not you, you can't you have to leave from the front as they say to, to use like a way overused <laughs> term right but um, if you are expecting your team to deliver on something in a certain way you it's that tell show do 
uh, way of, of training people. You have to demonstrate what you expect them to do. Don't just tell them what you expect and then hope that they deliver on it and then, you know, let the chips fall. That's, that's, that's the difference between training and education. I don't believe that we train people. I think that we train dogs and we train people in the military. Very tactical, ABC. In customer service business, in the hotel industry, in the restaurant, the food and beverage industry, we educate people and we give them the skill sets that they need and we give them the tools that they need, right? And then when we give them the process, that combined with their common sense, together with what they've learned from the guiding principles and the mission statement, 90% of the time you'll get the right result. But you cannot miss out on any of those steps. Yeah, I think about, you know, even just doing uh, lineups in restaurants when I was working on property, the most fun and engaging staff meetings that we had were the ones where we were doing a menu tasting, where the chef would come out and talk about, you know, whatever's in season or how, a certain new preparation or uh, doing a wine class uh, and talking yeah. about a different, uh, you know, varietal that might be on the menu. It was those experiences. And you could see, I mean, there was energy at the pre-shift. And then when they were on the floor, it just, the room felt different because people just, they're, they were, to your point, right? They were, they were engaged in a different way. Absolutely. It's, you know, like when we bring a, a new, you know, food and beverage manager on board, you know, I'll have them spend a week in the kitchen and they'll, they'll sit behind the line itself. I'll have them work as a busboy. I'll have them yeah. work as a waiter in the restaurant. Okay. And I'll have them work every single position so that they can fill in any position should they be able to need to do that. And I think yeah. that's the way in which we get someone to really be able to understand what the guest experience should be because they have experienced it firsthand and they know what the goal is and they know what the benchmark is. Yeah, and they know what the team that reports to them it does on a day-to-day -day basis so they, they know what a realistic expectation actually looks like. Correct. And for me, yeah. the daily lineup is the most important thing in any hotel. Who's coming in today? How can we be prepared? That's why, you know, there are two types of customer service. There's reactive. When something goes wrong, you know, we can put up our hand and we can buy ourselves some loyalty if we've handled it correctly. And probably 95% of the world's service providers offer that. I prefer mm -hmm. to serve up proactive customer service where we can anticipate the unanticipated needs of the guest, giving them what they never knew they wanted. And in today's world, you know, you can look at your daily lineup of who's coming in, we can go and look at data and information that is readily available because you look at someone's social media accounts, you can Google someone, you can use any form of, of a search engine, and you can find pretty much anything about anyone today. That is valuable information. So we could use that information to tailor the guest experience that they're going to have when they arrive. Classic example of a, a gentleman who was flying from New York to, Hong, to, from New York to Paris wanted Pepsi-Cola. They didn't have it on the on the plane, so he tweeted about it. When he got to the Four Seasons in Paris and checked into his room, the minibar was filled with Pepsi Cola, and there was an ice bucket, a clear glass ice bucket with four cans of Pepsi Cola inside. Bingo! <laughs> we created the emotional connection. Right? right. So the information's out there. It's just how do we get to anticipate those anticipated needs by using what's readily available to us? You know, that's such a simple, but but really important example because i i do think that the idea of creating emotional connections of using that that phrase it's very airy it's hard to get your arms around it's it's it, conceptually it might be um it's it just hard to understand how to put it into practice but that that example of ju just provide somebody Pepsi, just provide them something that you learn about them, even just in the conversation that you're having with them. It, it doesn't just uh, start and end in the reservation process. There's a whole song and dance and ebb and flow to the, the, um, the customer or the guest employee relationship is that if you're asking probing questions and you're actually interested in why they're there, you're going to learn a lot of information and things that you can take action on that will maybe make their stay two or three days in continue to be uh, really great and, uh, and sort of above what they would get from anywhere else just from being present. Yeah. And there's so many examples out there. You know, you find, for instance, a lady who has got a pet and she's not traveling with her pet, but you know, you can see from social media, how close, put the picture of that pet in a picture frame, put it next to the bed. 
bingo. Right? Or the general manager has got a text from the car driver and he says, you're two minutes out and he's standing out, outside in the front, at the front door to greet you. I mean, you've got one chance to make a first impression. If you're a VIP, that's the best way that we can do it. Or they arrange for you to check in your room. And then you get into your room and there's a handwritten personal note from somebody welcoming yeah. you to the hotel with an amenity. You know, those are all the things that we use to create that emotional connection, which is going to bias the loyalty that we're looking for in the first place. Yeah. But Colin, we don't have any staff. We can't do it. It's too hard. It's too hard to do consistently. I mean, have you, do you, have you had this, this pushback before? Oh, that'll never work. You know, oh, our guests don't want that. They, they want something else. I have had that. And, 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 you know, you're either with me or you're not with me. And I think that's mm -hmm. why part of surrounding yourself with the right team of people. That's what's most important. It's like, who do we get to do the heavy lifting and who's on board and who's not on board, right? And I think that's where it's sometimes, you know, I use this term so many times, ruthless editing. Ruthless editing mm -hmm. starts with the team that we work with. You want everyone on board to do what we need to do. But the second part of that question is, there's just no labor force anywhere in the world right now. Wherever you go, there's a shortage of staff. So I'm getting that answer too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a reality right now. Hopefully that, that means there's no it's one to do anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just about keeping the train on the tracks right now. But, uh, you know, but, but again, back to the consistency point, you know, even, even if you have to pull back a little bit on, on what you normally would do to welcome people in, if you're just doing the thing that you say you're going to do exceptionally well every single time, you're going to be doing better than most. Correct. And, and, and I put it this way. I said, make sure it's personal. Personalization. Create the connection with, with whoever it is that you're interacting with, whether it's looking them in the eyes, using their name, shaking their hand, whatever it might be. Create that connection. Then show exceptional attention to detail. Right? And then wrap it in a filter of elegance. I think when you ever put the word elegance in front of anything, it just naturally elevates the style. Right? Yeah. And yeah. therein, you've already just created a great first impression. How do you make sure that you've got the right people on your team? It comes really from being able to make sure that you're hiring the right people right? and that, 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 that you can build the teamwork and communication that you need because teamwork and communication are the brothers and sisters of success in delivering proactive customer service, just like standards and protocols are. So it all starts with the right team of people. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's interesting because you have to, this is part of, you know, my management style is I've always wanted an open door policy. I don't want managers to report to me. I want anyone to be able to report to me. I want to know what's going on in my business because sometimes four layers down, there might be some virus brewing that I didn't know about. And all of a sudden it's run through the whole company. Yeah. So it comes once again from having that very rich culture so that you can make sure that and culture for me is the passion that fuels successful customer service. Right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things we do to make sure that we've got a rich culture in the company? You know, I, 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 first of all, the open door policy is an important one. Company outings are really important. I like to recognize who was the best service provider for the last two weeks. We give them the baton in two weeks time. They recognize one of their coworkers who's done an incredible job setting them up for success and they pass the baton to them. Oh, wow. Another thing I do, my producers, you know, uh, I've got girls who work for maybe a year, maybe 14 months and delivering an extraordinary part in an event. So I want them to represent me well. And you know, I give them an allowance to go and buy a new dress and a new pair of shoes for that mm -hmm. event. I give them an allowance and I have the glam squad come in and do hair and makeup for all the girls on my team. So when they walk out into that floor, they represent me with confidence and with style and they're living the part. Wow. Well, and that's, man, I, you know, you and, just, and, and that, you just kind and, of... And, 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 yeah, and that, that is also... How do we create the emotional connection with the person who sits next to you, right? The, the emotional connection, not only for the man outside, it's not the external customer, it's for the internal customer who's sitting next to you. You want them emotionally connected. Yeah, it is. I, I could hear conversations that I've had in the past as you were talking about, especially, you know, giving an allowance for, for dress and shoes. I can hear conversations I've had in my career where 
uh, we we want to do something like that, but we don't have the budget, or you know, we don't have a lot of extra money for it. So maybe the allowance is is you, you cheap out on it a little bit, or you give them a Starbucks yeah. card as opposed to you know doing the right thing, um, and you know doing what you're talking about right now. And I think it's so easy and so common in our industry to fall uh, to fall back on uh, what the numbers on a spreadsheet say. Yeah. As opposed to understanding that there's intrinsic value in doing exactly what you're talking about that creates everything that this entire show has been about rather than just saying, oh, no, well, we just don't have – that's just not a line on a budget for us right now. Right. And if it's not on a budget, you know, it's about the gesture, just passing yeah. the baton, letting people recognize them in front of their peers is just as important as giving someone a hair and makeup or a clothing allowance. It's how, yeah. you know, just as we say, what is customer service? To, it's about how I make you feel. It's also how I make the internal personal feel because that's what builds the strong culture that's going to make sure there's someone in the office before I get there in the morning and someone who's there before after I've left in the evening. It's the yeah. commitment to want to do it better and better each time. Have you found, um, and I mean, this is probably really relevant right now given how hard it is for hospitality businesses to find people we'd be looking, we're likely looking at people that don't have any, um, what would be considered uh, on the grounds experience, working in restaurants, events, hotels, uh, but they they might have a talent for uh, creating great experiences or they can connect with people in a great way. Have you found in, in the past or maybe now, bringing people in that don't have any direct hospitality experience have have worked out really well for you adam i would rather bring in someone who has little experience but they have all the right traits in other words they've got the good personality they're proactive they've got lots of energy they present well uh, no is nothing that exists in there in there is is, is is not a word that exists in their vocabulary they will those type of people learn something very quickly right versus someone who's been doing the same job for the last you know, three or four years, who might be tired, who might be a little stale. So it's better to clean house every now and then and look from the outside because sometimes they bring skill sets right, that are only going to complement us because it's out of the usual field. Right? And you find that it, 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 all it does is it adds to the, the, to the story and makes it a much better and a more compelling story and allows them to be a better employee because they're bringing something to the job that's of value. Yeah, I think. And if you're open to it as a leader, if you're not threatened by somebody who's bringing yeah. in new ideas from the outside that can only make your business and the experience for your guests better, that's just going to, again, that's going to permeate, uh, is going to make them feel comfortable in this, this new world that they've entered into. Uh, and maybe they'll get the baton at some point too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you uh, to, to recite your most difficult customer experience. Uh, we've all had them in this industry. Um, we all have war stories. Uh, but, you know, anecdotally, we've heard a lot of stories about how some guests are maybe a little bit more difficult to uh, to, to please uh, in in the hospitality world right now. Um, and that's probably for a variety of reasons. Um, when you're dealing with difficult customers, um, what's your typical approach? I mean, there's, you can, I know you can kind of break it down into, you know, how you address them in person and then what you do on the back end from the learnings and the, and then retrain people. But, you know, what are some kind of some tried and true methods that you've uh, you've learned over the years that uh, kind of win over difficult customers and then allow you to improve your business? Just you know, I, I think every time a customer complains, right, it's an opportunity for us to learn more about them and improve our business practices. I think that's more important now today than ever before. Right, you've got one reputation and it's priceless. You do anything to protect your reputation, right? So every time there's a complaint and you did the right thing, you recovered, you can take a negative situation into a positive situation because you're now making a loyal customer out of that. You know, the dry cleaner who lost the shirt. And it's not always your fault, but it's how it's dealt with is what makes the huge difference. You know, it's mm -hmm. your responsibility and you're going to fix it. Right? 
You have everything to lose if you don't handle a complaint correctly, whether the person's difficult or not difficult. Right? And it can't be anything from a flight that doesn't take off time. It can be anything from a flight that doesn't take off time to a lost shirt. And I think that the worst thing to do with anyone in that situation is to be defensive. You have to mm-hmm. accept responsibility, even if it's a gray area. You know, the one thing I do is I teach everyone the power of that immediate one minute apology. Anyone who's customer facing, because you've got a right to be very upset if your room is not ready and was promised in a certain time. If we lost your shirt, you got a right to be upset. OK, so I think the most important thing is acknowledge the situation. Apologize in the most sincere manner possible. When someone is sitting there screaming and shouting and you say, I'm very, very sorry, I apologize, okay, I'm going to take responsibility for this and I'm going to fix this for you, it's very calming and it diffuses the situation. It takes all the hot air out of it. I am going to fix this for you. So give me an hour and I'll get back to you. You set your phone for 55 minutes and you make sure you call back within the hour, right? And then you recover and you fix it, whether you've got to go and buy a shirt and have it run over to his room, freshly ironed and steamed. You do whatever you need to do. At that stage, it's not important who's right or who's wrong. We just want to recover. And once we've recovered, afterwards we can figure out how do we reset and how do we prevent this from ever happening again. So you can really take a negative situation, no matter how bad it is, and you put the right spin on it with the right attitude and your team have been given the right tools to work with, you can turn it around. You can make an unhappy person a happy person. I guess in a very odd, ironic kind of a way, if somebody was having a, maybe an unremarkable but normal stay, uh, but then experienced a problem and you turn it around, that's actually, you may create a raving fan of your property out of that because of how you recovered from it. Absolutely. Listen, life, life doesn't go according to plan ever. So it's, you know, how do we turn it around? I think that's where we need to put the positive spin in a situation. And then you go out of your way, you know, if the, if the, the you know, you, you, you want to create that loyalty, but at the same time, you have the opportunity to be able to strengthen the emotional connection, right? They're traveling with a pet. You send a pet toy or you send a, a, a dog bone to the room. Right? A little place made in a bowl. They've got a kid mm-hmm. with them. You give them a teddy bear. It's like, how do we stay emotionally connected to these people? During the pandemic, Adam, one of the things that I did was I had a lot of time on my hands, probably like you and a lot of other people. <laughs> and I think it was like, how do I stay in front and how do I cement and strengthen the emotional connection that I have with my clients? At some stage, we're going to get back and we're going to start partying again. I want them to call me first before anybody else. So I took some of my big events and I picked the most beautiful picture and I had 1,500 piece jigsaw puzzles made and I sent them to the family. Oh, wow. The family spent a week working on that together. Right? Yeah. Other people, yeah. I sent playlists from my last three parts and said, listen, if you need to party with your wife, throw in a pair of shiny shoes, a pair of heels and crank up the volume, you can have a good time at home. We sent recipes for cocktails. We sent fabulous tried and tested recipes. We sent them photo galleries of things that they'd seen and done in, that they had seen and done before. Just once again to strengthen that whole idea of what the connection really is about. I, I, and none of these things cost a lot of money. It just it doesn't cost takes a lot of money at all. It takes a little time bit of imagination. Thought. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and and caring about about it. Um, and, and that's, you know, as we're talking about this, I mean, to sum up the entire show, at the end of the day, it's just about caring, right? It's just about having a little bit of imagination. It's about wanting to, it's about wanting to imprint the experience into, or making a memory for people yeah. at the end of the for day. Sure. And it's not and a hard thing to it, do. In hospitality, the, you know, the two most important things we want to do is make you feel welcome and make you feel comfortable. Then we want to listen to you and do everything we can to give you the best guest experience possible because that will make it memorable. And that's what we're going to stand out in their mind. It's the small things that people talk about at dinner parties. Uh, they don't talk about the, the three-acre pool and the, and the building, this, that, and anything. They talk about the things that you did. That's why I say, and I, I strengthen this so much in the gold stand, that customer service it's all about how I make you feel, right? And then on the back side of it, we're constantly looking for opportunity. 
to find an opportunity to be able to interact with you positively and do something that's going to make you or one of your family members or one of your delegation incredibly happy. Because it paves the way for next time. Uh, absolutely. Colin, this was uh, uh, enlightening uh, and really appreciate you giving uh, a little bit of a look behind the curtain on uh, how what you do you do it so well, and you've been able to make such a name for yourself. Um, if anybody wants to learn more about you or what you're up to now with Thrive Hospitality, where should they go? So follow us on thrivehospitality.com. You can also follow my colincowielifestyle.com. And of course, the book is The Gold Standard, Giving Your Customers What They Didn't Know They Wanted. And it's been out for a few days. Sounds good. I'll link to everything in the show notes. Again, thank you so much for being on the show. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks, Adam. Had a great time with you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.